This is the After Party, live with Kim McAllister. Pick a couch, grab a drink, and settle into the conversation. Good afternoon. It is the After Party Live, and I thank you for being here. Uh, like Hawaiian music always just settles me right down. Thank you for spending time with me today. It's Trivia Thursday, and I'm hoping uh, if I put the name or the, the list of the show, the link to get on the show, in the chat section that you may want to actually pop on with me and play in person. Now, you don't have to be on video like I am which I wish I wasn't either. You could do a video, you could do the shadowy figure or what have you. But uh, if anybody wants to play along, I would love it. And so I will go ahead and put this right here. And there you have it. Um, and so if you would like to play uh, trivia after we do some stories, please do. I see that Jim uh, Lou is here today and he and I were talking about a great trivia category for this week and it is going to be islands so uh it kind of fits with the whole island vibe of the show we'll do some island trivia a little bit later on he's got his questions are really hard that he's submitted mine are a little bit easier so i don't know well i think they're easier so uh huge thanks to portions redacted for catching a typo in the show title today all fixed everything as well uh, we're good to go. Yes, I always forget to ask you to click the like button if you could. Just click it right now and you won't have to think about it again. Thank you for doing that. It helps YouTube decide what they're going to show people and, and grow the show. So thank you for that. If you uh, haven't subscribed yet, I would appreciate it if you could do that as well. Um, yeah, ready to party. No more Trump. That's right. We don't need any more of that. We've had enough, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, we know where the party is. That's right. Hey, it's a, it's the little show that could. We're just going to keep doing it and see what happens, right? Yeah, I clicked it. I clicked it. Yes, thank you for clicking it. Clicking that like, like button. All right, let's jump in with uh, the our lead story of the day. And that is, do you think it's okay? Do you? Not okay, because it's legal to do it. But do you think it's ethically okay to go somewhere and take a piece of history and then sell it. In this particular situation, what we're talking about is going to the watery grave that is the Titanic and taking this piece of the Titanic, this chunk of a wood panel, a piece of history, and then selling it at auction. There's something about it to me that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Again, I know it's completely legal, right? You can go down there, you know, if you can get there, take a bunch of stuff off and sell it at auction and enrich yourself. Uh, there's part of me that thinks it should just be left alone. It sank like that. That's where people died. There's still their skeletons aboard. Just leave it where it rests. Somebody bought this at auction. It went for $718,750. I don't know what you would, I mean, what are you going to do with it? Just put it up in a frame and display it somewhere? They call it one of the most controversial wooden planks in cinematic history. It's a door frame panel that saved Rose's life in the movie, The Titanic, 1997. So, this is actually not a piece of the boat or the ship itself. It's a piece of movie memorabilia. Uh, it's sold as part of a Planet Hollywood movie memorabilia auction. And a lot of people bid on this thing. And again, the winning bid, $718,750. Now, we've seen other items from the actual Titanic that were taken from the ship and sold. This is movie memorabilia. It's made from balsa wood, right? It's, um, they say it's the most fam famous complete piece of debris salvaged from the real sinking of the Titanic in 2012. It, it's based on that. So this is a prop, but it's based on the real thing that was salvaged from the Titanic. 
people often call it a door, I guess, but it was really part of the door frame right above the first class lounge entrance. And the even the auction house is saying, yeah, you know, this prop has caused a lot of debate from fans. Many people say it could have supported Jack and Rose. They even did tests about this. Um, James Cameron did a, had a study done. Kind of funny. But yeah, so this is the piece of the door that she was on that saved her life in the movie, the Rose character. And it goes for $718,000. That's wild to me that anyone would pay that much for that. Something else that we have talked a lot about on this show is the whole robo-taxi situation. And we know it didn't go well in San Francisco with the striking of a pedestrian by a car driven by a driver knocking that person under the wheels or in front of a robo-taxi who didn't you know, know exactly what to do with that scenario. So we've seen robo-taxi service suspended in San Francisco, but in New York City, they're just getting started. The testing for New York City is coming. And I would argue this, <clears throat> that if you have a big city like San Francisco where things went wrong, just wait until you go to New York City, right? San Francisco is was kind of like mini on the scale of comparison to the streets and the busyness of the New York City roadways. But they will likely soon have autonomous vehicles competing with taxi cabs through the streets of New York. When they begin, just like here, they're going to have to have a person sitting behind the wheel. They have safety requirements, they say, for self-driving cars on public roads. And this all means that AV testing will be coming. The hope is, like the hope was here, that eventually, eventually they'll be able to just deploy it. You know, they put in some safety uh, regulations and that they'll be able to just go for it. But given some accidents, some um, incidents that have happened in other cities, I don't know. Because of that, though, the testing in New York requires a safety driver behind the wheel ready to take over at all times. And that didn't happen in Phoenix, which has already allowed Waymo vehicles to do rider-only trips on city streets. In New York, they also have a, a permit documentation. It doesn't mention any of these companies by name, but it says only companies with past testing in other cities will be considered for testing in New York City. The safety drivers have to have a driver's license, go, undergo the background checks to prove that they're trained in the vehicles they're testing. They have to be able to take frequent breaks so they don't get too tired behind the wheel as well. So this is all underway in uh, New York City. I ask, what could go wrong? But the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, says, this technology is coming whether we like it or not. So we're going to make sure that we get it right. If we do, he said, our streets can be safer and our air could be cleaner. So that's what's going on in New York City. It'll be really interesting to see if they have success with this. All right, we're jumping into the animal segment. And here we go. This lady thought, <laughs> tried to rescue a little creature. She is in Cheshire, England. She th thought she saw this and she thought, oh no, it's an abandoned little baby hedgehog. I will scoop it up and I will take it to the vet. And so she did. She scoops it up. She take it, takes it to the vet. They check it out at the Lower Mosswood Nature Reserve uh, and Wildlife Hospital. They called her a very kind soul who rescued what she thought was a baby hedgehog. And it turns out she rescued a pom-pom from a beanie hat. <laughs> she brings it into the hospital, concerned that it hadn't moved all night or gone to the a ba bathroom all night. And that's when the vet says, yeah, it's a palm from, from a beanie hat. She's in her 60s or 70s, very well-spoken and well-meaning. They call her, again, a kind soul. 
And this pom-pom from the hat was sitting on the side of a roadway looking kind of like a hedgehog. She didn't even touch it. She scoops it in a box with some, puts some cat food in there and leaves it alone in a warm, dark space. She didn't even look at it because she didn't want to stress it out too much. So the vet said she did everything well. She had good intentions. She was really trying. They said on their Facebook post, remember, kindness knows no bounds, even when it's to a faux furry friend. I give her some credit for trying, right? Yeah, I didn't move because it's not an animal. It's okay. I mean, you don't know until you try. How about this one? We have had stories about horses that have fallen into waterways before, but you can see the ridge around the area. This is somebody's swimming pool. So this horse falls into the swimming pool and no one sees. This happened in the state of Georgia. The horse, who's na named Sweet Girl, Sweet Girl, she gets out of her fenced enclosure and manages to wander to a nearby swimming pool, falls into the shallow end, and she ends up spending the whole night in the swimming pool. And she's finally found the next day. So the firefighters come out, the rescuers come out, and they have to... For some reason, I guess they can't lead her up the steps of the pool. Maybe there are, are no steps. I don't, I don't know. It would seem like it wouldn't be hard for a horse to get out of the shallow end. But for whatever reason, it was very difficult. So the crews had to hoist her using ropes out of the pool and back onto dry land. And after she got out, she was spending some time in the sunshine, enjoying being out of that water. So horse rescued, all is well there in the state of Georgia. Not so in the Netherlands, where raccoons are on the lamb. <laughs> yeah, nine raccoons got out of the Netherlands Zoo somehow. Actually, not nine, 11. 11 raccoons escaped from their enclosure at the facility. And they're smart and crafty and tricky, and I completely understand why they'd want out of there. Although... You know, somebody's feeding them all the time, but they like to roam, these guys. Officials at Aqua Zoo in Leeuwarden said 12 raccoons arrived on Monday and a caretaker showed up Tuesday morning to find only one left. Eleven had checked out. They did find two later in the day, but nine of the animals are still on the run. They... They looked at the enclosure and apparently a couple pieces of mesh didn't fit together properly anymore. And that allowed the raccoons to dig their way out and dig they did. So the folks from the zoo have set up traps to catch them without hurting them um, at the nature preserve nearby in case they uh, managed to climb over the fence into the nature preserve. And they've all been spayed or neutered, so... It's not like they're going to, you know, have a little wild colony out there. They don't think these raccoons are a danger to humans, but they are trying to get them back. I just think it's funny. Raccoons, you know, don't try to contain a raccoon. Leave the raccoons alone. They know what they need. They know what they want to do. Always love a good gator story. And boy, do we have one. This is King Arthur is his name. King Arthur, sadly, in South Carolina is at this golf course with a, a tomato cage. You can kind of see it there. You know, the, the cone-shaped things made of wire that you put around the tomato to kind of help the vines grow up. He got one stuck on his head. Yeah. He hangs out most often at a South Carolina golf course. They call him King Arthur. And unfortunately, if they don't get this tomato cage off of his head... They think it could put his life at risk. He won't be able to eat. It's a situation. The 11-foot gator nicknamed King Arthur at the Fripp Island Golf and Beach Resort because of the crown-like tomato cage surrounding his head. They've called in uh, researchers from the Coastal Ecology Lab at the University of Georgia to try to help this alligator out. Is alligator or crocodile? Uh, alligator. And... Um, they say it, 
it's really tempting to try to just jump in and and help remove whatever is on the face. But they say it's not always the best move, that sometimes the animal can get free of whatever is stuck on their own. So they spent a couple of days monitoring King Arthur, and he did manage to break off part of the cage on his head, but there's still part of it, I guess, that's wrapped pretty tightly around his neck. They waited another couple of days, and it seems that he hadn't made any more progress trying to get this thing off. And then other things started to get caught in the cage, right? Um, And they thought the metal could snag on something underwater and maybe cause Arthur to drown. It was kind of tricky for them, but they tried. So after a few tries, they were able to secure him, and they were able to get the rest of the cage off. And now that he's free of it, they say he can start living his best alligator life. They, what the thought is, is that this tomato cage might have washed up uh, into a pipe and then ended up around King Arthur when he tried to crawl through a pipe. And it's another reminder of why you need to throw your trash away properly. So... Uh, The golf course says we are so thankful to the naturalists and the UGA Coastal Ecology Lab for helping our beloved King Arthur. What's nice is that they embrace having this alligator there and everyone knows he's there, right? So that people can be careful and they don't, you know, call the wildlife people and say, get him out. No, they know it's just part of their life there and their, their habitat. And he lives there too. Pardon me. Okay, off we go to, I think I have a a video for this next story. And this is about a digging dog. This dog is in Florida. And, you know, dogs, sometimes they're going to dig. And they, this dog dug, unfortunately, uncovering something that was a little bit scary and sketchy. So there's a news report out of Florida that I wanted to share with you about what happened with this digging dog. So let's see if I can show it to you. Hold on. I'll get it. Here it is. I have to make it big so you guys can see it. So it's not unusual for a dog to dig when they go in the backyard. I see it all the time. Yeah, but it's what a dog unearthed in Jacksonville that had the owner calling in the bomb squad. That's because the dog dug up a piece of an unexploded military ordinance. Can't make this stuff up. Its owner first got curious after seeing something sticking out of the ground. He actually started pulling it out when he realized what it was. The bomb squad then came in and evacuated neighbors before removing the device. Wow. I've been doing some research over here, and that looks to be like a 120 millimeter mortar. Can route. you imagine? Like, let me just pull that out with my hand. Does, that, would, does that make a big boom? It, it, <laughs> I don't know what that my, means. My description is not for TV. Right? Gotcha. But, but gotcha. It, whatever's yes. around it is no more. Would be no more. So the dog is digging and finds this uh, old mortar and. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not what you want to see your dog, your dog do, right? The dog's name is Baby, playing in the yard when she finds this metallic object next to the garage. And uh, the bomb squad comes out, and they say it's an unexploded piece of military ordnance, likely buried for decades because it was in quite the state of delay. They had to um, even clear people out of nearby homes in order to get rid of it, so... All is well, it ends well in uh, with the digging dog. There's another world record that we have to tell you about, and I can't play it for you. It's kind of a bummer that I can't play it for you because I really want to. But the Guinness Book of World Record people are very territorial about their videos. But this is a record set when a man from China drank 1.1 gallons of water and then brought it back up, regurgitates it, right, as a human fountain. His fountain continued for a record-breaking 5 minutes and 51.8 seconds. So for more than 5 minutes, he has water spewing out of his mouth. And that's a world record. That's the weirdest categories. This 35-year-old man 
down the water and then use muscle control to bring it back up and spray this stream of water that beat the record that was held previously by a man from Ethiopia. The old record was 56.36 seconds. This man's record, his name is Ma Hui. He did it for five minutes, 51.8 seconds. Is that crazy? They have rules about this thing too. They're very serious. I mean, it's not just like kind of spurting from his mouth. The rules for the longest time to spray water from the mouth require the the um, the water be spurted or sprayed. No dribbling. You can't have a dribble. And the record attempt ends when the stream breaks or stops. So you can't spurt it and then stop and then spurt more. It has to be a continuous like fountain, right? They say it's a trick involving very precise muscle control. And there have been people doing this since the 17th century. I don't understand the why behind this. All I can tell you is that we have a new record set. And that's the story. Here's a science story. Here we go. Let's talk about nano spikes. I love this. You got um, Silicon Valley spikes, right? This is a new material, supposedly neutralizing 96% of virus cells using nanospikes. It's a smooth silicon wafer covered in very tiny virus-slaying needles. The research being done at Australia's Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, the RMIT, and they have made this new silicon, silicon, I call it silicone, silicone material for hospitals, labs, and other sensitive environments. It has the look and feel kind of of a flat black mirror. But when you look at it up under microscope, it actually is what they call a thorny death trap for pathogens. This is published in the journal ACS Nano. The team spent more than two years coming up with this material. It's smooth to the human touch. But again, at the microscopic level, you see all these nano spikes, and they're small and they're sharp, and they can impale individual cells. Kind of like, you know, when someone in a movie is trapped in a chamber and the walls start closing in and the walls are spiked? Kind of like that. In lab tests, 96% of all HPIV virus cells that came into contact with the material's needles either tore apart or came away so badly damaged that they couldn't replicate and create their usual infections like pneumonia, croup, or bronchitis. With no external assistance, these eradication levels, they say, were accomplished within six hours. They got them. They... Researchers came up with this idea from insects. Prior, they say, to designing the spiky re- spiky silicone, researchers looked at the structural composition of cicada and dragonfly wings, which has, have evolved to feature similarly sharp nanostructures capable of skewering fungal spores and bacteria cells. Again, biomimicry, where it's at. Viruses are far more microscopic than even bacteria, meant for effective spikes needed to be um, comparably smaller. So they had to come up with something that would work on a smaller level. So they designed this silicone wafer to completely bombard ions. During the process, they directed the ions to chip away at specific areas of the wafer, wafer, creating a two nanometer thick 290 nanometer tall spires. So it's about 30,000 times thinner than a human hair. And the hope is from the researchers that one day this can be applied on top of commonly touched surfaces, 
right? Because we feel that it's smooth. That's desktops. That's nightstands. That's the little tray you eat off of in the hospital. That's the cup that you're drinking out of. All of these things that could have bacteria on them or whatnot. Implementing this cutting edge technology in high risk environments like labs, healthcare facilities where exposure to biomaterials is a concern, they say, could significantly bolster containment measures against infectious diseases. By doing so, they say we aim to create safer environments for researchers, healthcare professionals, and patients alike. Hey, if they can do this without chemicals or things that, you know, like the hand sanitizer is so strong that they say uh, it can create, um, make us even uh, more susceptible to bacteria somehow, right? But in this case, they're just relying on these mechanical methods to clean up spaces. They stab the virus cells like little shish kebabs. The designers think the overall chemical disinfectant usage could decrease. And so, yeah, and that is what they say, a major concern because of the continued rise of superbugs. Is that cool or what? I'm telling you, I, this is why I love this show. We can get into the weird stuff. I'm going to the chat. Would it kill flesh-eating bacteria? Theoretically, I don't know if they tested for that. They'd have to test for everything. Oh, cicadas along A. Thank you. Yeah, I always say it wrong. I appreciate it. Uh, drinking a lot of water can be dangerous. Oh, talking about that, this spewing. Yeah, I know. I remember that. That was in, uh, was it in Sacramento that happened where there was a prize for drinking all the water? In this case, the person drank more than a gallon and then immediately spat it back out. I, I don't know. Mo writes, would this method impede a resistant strain uh, since there are no antibiotics involved. <sighs> Sciencey questions that I don't know. I'm sure they're testing it on all types of bacteria, viruses, etc. But they, the researchers are saying that in their testing, this thing managed to get rid of, neutralize is the word they use, 96% of virus spells, uh, cells. So 96% of virus spells just using these nano spikes, these little skewers. Hey, I think this is a great, you know, idea. So um, the water spring video is pretty amazing. I know I wish I could show it. I'm so sorry that I can't. You can find it online though. Uh, thank you for all your comments. I appreciate it. Let's move on to pictures of a, the male member. I'm not going to show you any. I'm not going to. <laughs> it's not this kind of show, people. We'll look, look at the pixeled picture on the phone instead. Why don't we? <laughs> They're asking people, please think twice before you let AI scan your male member for sexually transmitted infections. There's a website promising that their AI service can accurately scan pictures of penises for signs of sexually transmitted disease. And healthcare advocates and digital privacy experts are among critics of this, saying, you know what, don't do that. Just don't do it. The company is called He Health. He Health. And they're they're describing themselves as an online way to get answers about your health in minutes of your, you know, your, your parts. To receive the information, they use a combination of questionnaires, uh, which they say are 65 to 96% accurate, which is kind of a big spread. They use I, AI, a screening tool, allegedly trained on proprietary data sets to flag photographic evidence of various STIs. And that includes genital warts, herpes eruptions, syphilis, even cancer is one of the things that they can, they say they can pick up. So if the results come back positive, he health then refers you to your healthcare professional so that you can actually have a doctor look at you, diagnose you, and then treat you. 
it it's kind of flown under the radar this whole he health scanning of the male member thing but 31,000 people have reportedly done it it's supposed to be anonymous so i mean unless you know the male member can you really tell one from another i'd like to think i could pick out the male member in this house that i'm married to <laughs> He's much more than the male member, but I could pick it his out probably. Like I would know it, but who knows? Maybe they're more similar than I realize. Oh God, I'll stop talking. Uh, but it's supposed to be anonymous. You're not supposed to be able to tell one from another. They they say you should think of it as your intimacy bestie for the uh oh moments. No waiting, no guessing. Just scan a picture and see if you have anything weird. I, I I I can't even. No. They even say it can be intimate. You know, you can have your wife, or your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or whomever scan the picture of your partner's unit to see if there's anything going on, so you can participate in this thing together. I don't know. I don't know. They say. They're already changing the conversation around sexual health. I would argue that taking a picture of your male member is never a good idea. Or taking a picture of your female parts is never a, a good idea if you don't want those things to end up on the internet seen by someone else. We know that anything you put online is out there forever. And even if you think it's private, you have to assume it's not. Mm -mm. The he health thing says uh, they have 65 to 90% reliability. So I don't think that's enough to really like if they said, we can tell you 100% whether you have something or not. I could see why people would want to click on it. I, I, I don't. I don't know. So there's no age verification, apparently, on this. And so it's easy to see how maybe a kid could panic and use it. And that is what um, some of the criticisms are in this, about this thing. Lack of age verification, no checkbox that you're 18, very dubious privacy practices as well. So... You know, I mean, do they are they going to share it? Do they really have it connected with your email address? Could they figure out who you are? All of this. I don't think so. What about you guys? Are you going to take a picture of yours or your loved one's parts? Josh says no pictures unless you're getting paid. <laughs> That's pretty good. Heather says one of my BFFs used her work phone to send a picture to her gyno before a visit. And you can probably guess how that turned out. Oh, my God, no. Oh, uh, agree, Josh. That's crazy. I mean, it's a, it would be enough, Heather, to use your private phone. And I would still worry that whatever I took a picture of is floating out there in the internet universe, right? But to use your work phone? Come on. There it is, says Mindy, floating around at the company party. Oh, no. Mama says, I think it should be common sense not to take pictures of your privates. SF Tesla, people are perching atop copy machines. No wonder those things are always breaking down. Oh, department. Oh, do you want to Heather say? Dudes will take any excuse to snap a pic. Exactly. Josh, Department of STDs and Measurements. Karen writes, this takes advantage of guys who will do anything but go to the doctor if they can. There is that. Yeah. No. Karen says, how stupid and gullible do you have to be to take advantage of that? I don't know. I can't. Yeah, no. This is the kind of thing, though, you know, I have a 10 year old son. You can't believe the conversations in this house, the things I that come out of my mouth that I never thought in a million years, I would say penis related. I'm like, don't do this. Don't do that to it. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm telling you. Yes, Heather, I wouldn't even use my private phone. No. Mama wants to know what kind of gynecologist is asking for pictures. I don't, I think it's probably 
you take the picture and send it and are like, hey, I just want to let you know I have this. I, I don't know. I don't think a doctor would ask you to do that. No. No. I'm telling you, it takes all kinds. Oh, gosh. Look how late it is. We haven't even done trivia yet. Let's get to it. Again, I'm going to put this in the chat. If you want to participate, you can. This is, and I'll take this away. This is Thursday trivia. Are you ready for it? Category Island trivia. I had my Island trivia uh, page up here. Now I have to get it back again. Oh, no. Island trivia it is. All right, maybe I need to do one more story while I get myself all situated. Uh, let's do this. Let's talk about um, Easter candy by state because Easter's coming up this weekend. And I'll tell you the most popular candy in the state of California. Here's the graph of the most popular candy by state. Cadbury cream eggs are the most popular in California. Would you look at that? Reese's peanut butter cups are the yellow. Mm. The Cadbury cream eggs are the pink. The purple is going to be the Easter variety pack. Okay. Snickers uh, Milky Way pack. That's the turquoise one. And light green is Starburst jelly beans. Now that's up here in the light green. Well, it looks like most of the country is down with the Reese's peanut butter eggs. Those are big sellers. But so are the Cadbury cream eggs. God, it's so bad for you. You remember yesterday we're talking about um, about how you eat one of those and you don't realize that it's like nearly your your whole caloric intake for the entire day. And here you've just consumed the whole thing. Bam. Yeah. I, you know, you got to be careful. Got to be very, very careful. Okay. How about some trivia? Are we going to do it? I think we should. Hold on. This is hard to do by myself. I'm telling you guys. All right. We have interesting islands of the world first up. And again, I do have the link up there. So if you are interested in participating, you can do it. What is the question number one? The island group that makes up the only island state in the United States of America. This is an easy one. I'm giving, it's like that first question on who wants to be a millionaire. I'm kind of throwing you a little bone here, right? What is the island group that makes up the only island state in the United States of America? And I'm going to the chat because I'm sure that you guys have this right. And that is correct. Heather jumping in with the right answer. Sandy's got it. Karen's got it. Uh, Jim. Yeah. Hawaii is the right answer. Well done. Question two. What is the name of the Caribbean island that Haiti and the Dominican Republic share? I will not give you the, uh, the choices because I think a lot of you are going to know this. It's kind of an easy one. What is the name of of the uh, Caribbean island that Haiti and the Dominican Republic both share it. What is the name of it? I'm going to the chat. It is, yes, Jim, Hispaniola is the correct answer for that. I knew somebody would get it really quickly. Yes, Gordon, Hispaniola. That's correct. All right, question three. Here we go. In which of the following bodies of water would be the Isle of Man. Would it be the English Channel, the Irish Sea, the Bristol Channel, or the North Sea? In which of the following bodies of water would be the Isle, Isle of Man? English Channel, Irish Sea, Bristol Channel, or North Sea? I don't know if I would have gotten this one right, but let's see if you did. Mm-hmm, you did. <laughs> William's like, I suck at this category. There might be some more easy ones coming up. Yes, it is indeed, Jennifer, the Irish Sea. Tis the Irish Sea. Karen says Irish Sea, rather. Yeah, Walter. Mm-hmm. All right. Next one. Good job, you guys. Greenland and Iceland 
are separated by which body of water named after another country? Greenland and Iceland. That's my dividing line. Greenland and Iceland. In between. They're divided by, uh, separated by which body of water named after another country? Let's see if you guys get this one. Jennifer, for the win! Fast, too. Denmark Strait. Uh, Greenland and Iceland, it says, shares an interesting history that has both European and indigenous Eskimo roots. So the body of water separating the two islands, the Denmark Strait, is sometimes also referred to as Greenland Strait. It's about uh, 500 kilometers long, 300 kilometers wide, and it reflects the political connection that Greenland has with Denmark. Greenland uh, was a territory of Denmark. So next one. Which island located in French Guyana operated as a penal colony in the 19th and early, early 20th centuries? French Guyana. Which island operated as a penal colony in the 19th and early 20th centuries? You get it. Jennifer, Devil's Island is right. That's what it's called. Mm. It's right off of the coast of French Guyana, used as a penal colony where France sent its most undesirable prisoners, including its political criminals as well. They sent them there to the devil's area. So, mm. all right. I don't see Jim Liu here, but it's all right. But I have some of his questions as well. The devil, that's what they say. All right. So... Let's see if I can't ask some of Jim's questions. Uh, which country con controls the Isle of Bali? Which uh, country controls the Isle of Bali? <laughs> Elise. <laughs> I said penal. I did. Right after a penal story, as a matter of fact. Which country controls the Isle of Bali? Yeah, I know that one. It is. Uh, it is Indonesia. Well done. There you go. Indonesia, says Mars. Colors of the Wind has it. Indonesia. JT's got it as well. All right. Here's one. Uh, what island did the United States win from the British in the War of 1812? Which island did the United States win from the British in the War of 1812? I have a little bit of history in that one. What do we know? What do we know? Um, oh, and here's, by the way, if you guys wanted to play, here's the link again. Nope, wasn't Cuba. Mm -mm. It wasn't Cuba or Cuba. It wasn't. It's um, in the United States, like mainland area. And I will tell you also... It's technically, a, it's in a Midwest state. I think it's a Midwest state. Rhode Island. No, it's not. It wasn't, it's not Rhode Island, but that's good. Love it. Virgin Islands. Nope. Mm -mm. You guys want the answer? Okay, I'll tell you the answer. The answer, according to Jim Liu, is Mackinac Island, right? That's in Michigan? Yeah. Uh, that is the island that the United States won from the British in the War of 1812, Mackinac. What island is off of Cape Cod? This is another Jim Liu question. I love that he, he, he fed me questions. This is great. What island is off of Cape Cod? Hmm. A lot of famous people vacation here. A lot of things happen. Yeah, Jennifer, it's Martha's Vineyard. That's right. Heather had it too. Jim had it. SJ Lola had it. Right on. Next Jim Liu question. And by the way, if you guys are, please, I invite you to email me, Kim at the afterparty.live. Email me what? Don't email me pictures of your member. I was going to say, email me anything hmm, within reason. Email me trivia, cat trivia categories that you like or questions that you think would be good to ask or story ideas. Lori uh, emails me story ideas all the time. So I uh, really appreciate any input and contributions that you have in that way. So please, please, please do that. Okay. 
um, this you're going to get really fast. What U.S. state has an island with the same name as the state? What U.S. state has an island with the same name as the state? Hmm. Someone already said it this uh, in another question. Ooh. So that would be correct. That is not the one that he named. I'm going to give that to you. I'm going to give it to you. Although it's not called the Big Island, but I guess that's kind of slang for the Big Island of Hawaii. This is the one he had listed, Rhode Island. But I'm taking both. I think both are correct. So uh, executive decision on that one. Mm -hmm. How about this one? Why is it called Easter Island? Why is this island called Easter Island? You know, the ones with the Easter Island uh, statues. Why is it called Easter Island? <clears throat> Pardon me for coughing. Why is it called Easter Island? I didn't know this. I mean, it makes perfect sense. But why is it called Easter Island? Yeah, because it was discovered on Easter Sunday. That's right. Karen has it. Gordon has it. All right. I'll do a couple more of these questions. Um, in 1602, a priest was sailing around the New World and incorrectly drew onto a map an island which, uh, and which future U.S. state did he, uh, which future, uh, became a future U.S. state. 1602, priest sailing around the New World incorrectly draws onto a map what he thinks is an island which turns into a future U.S. state. Do we know what it is? I wouldn't have known what this is. This is a hard question. I wouldn't have known this. So I won't wait too long for your answer. I'll give you a heartbeat to answer it, and then I'll, I'll just tell you. Most of us live here. It's the state of California. I would not have known this. Um, okay. Old Canadian maps. This is from Jim, too. From the 1500s had a demon island said to have demons that harassed and stranded a couple still waiting to this very day to be rescued. It is believed to be Quirpon Island, which is off the coast of a more famous, bigger island named what? This old Canadian map from the 1500s had a demon island said to have harassed and stranded a couple that wait there in, for eternity to be rescued. Believed to be a, a Quirpon Island off the coast of a larger, more well-known, um, bigger island. What is the name of that island? It is not Vancouver. It is not o Oak. It is indeed Newfoundland. John Slade gets it. Should I do one more for uh for island trivia? Let's do one more. What is the large island state that lies off the Australian mainland southern coast? What is the large island state that lies off the Australian mainland's southern coast? Hmm. Yes, it is Tasmania. Right on. Um, here's one for you. In the 12th century, oops, sorry, I'll take Jennifer's thing. Well done, Jennifer. In the 12th century, Marco Polo heard of islands past China. One was named Java Minor, which is, uh, was substantiated later as Sumatra. But no one would believe the rumor of the one he named Java La Grande, the largest island in the world. What island was that? So Marco Polo hears of islands past China, one named Java Minor, that is now Sumatra. No one, though, would believe the rumor of the one named Java La, La Grande, the largest island in the world. What island was it? It was indeed Australia. I think S.J. Lola had it. Oh, I keep trying to click on her. Yeah. SJ Lola had it. Absolutely. Walter had it. And Mo had it. Good job, you guys. Chris, look at you guys. All right. Last follow-up question. This one also from Jim. Later, 
some cartographers named this ghost island Terra Australis, and Marco Polo said it was a place so full of gold, it inspired a man named Columbus. What island did Columbus find first? I would never know this. What island did Columbus find first? Huge thank you, to, by the way, to Jim Liu for coming up with all of these island questions that are so interesting and good. I love this. It's not Cuba. Mm -mm. And it's not Hispaniola. No está Cuba. Japan. Japan. It's not what Jim has. Jim's answer to this question is Samana in the Bahamas. S-A-M-A-N-A. -A -A, Samana in the Bahamas. So Jim was, we were trying to get Jim to, to come on the show and, and play trivia with me today, but he had kid pickups and kid afternoons, so he couldn't do it. But if you want to participate uh, next week on Trivia Thursday, please shoot me a message. We can come up with a category together. I welcome you to participate. And again, even if you pop on and you don't have your video showing or you don't even have a picture showing, it's totally fine. If all we hear is your voice, I'm good. We're good. So um, can please consider that. I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. A little rainy and drizzly out there. It feels kind of like a, a cold, chilly day. Uh, my daughter is headed to New York City on a four-day-long band trip. They have been fundraising for this trip all year long. Bake sales and band concerts and fundraisers. So I'm really excited that she gets to see New York City, a place which I've never been. When last she texted me during the Mark Thompson show, she was on a, her plane had stopped in Missouri where they have a layover. <laughs> what a sad little place for a layover. But um, but yeah, so that's what's going on. I'll, uh, best of luck to Julia. Thank you. That's so nice. Uh, she plays 10 instruments, but the one she took with her to New York is the bassoon. That's the one she's, I don't want to say most serious about. Lately, she's been playing the snare drum, um, but she plays, see if I can name them all. Piano, ukulele, flute, oboe, bassoon, snare drum, marimba, vibraphone. I'm missing two. I have to get better at doing that. She, The girl can't pick an instrument, cannot pick an instrument, loves them all, wants to try them all. But she's in the Santa Rosa Youth Symphony Orchestra as a bassoonist. She's in the uh, high school marching band uh, playing the flute. And she's joining this year the woodwind band class and also the jazz band class uh, playing her bassoon. Oh, saxophone. I left out saxophone. So, yeah. She, uh, oh, Josh is a symphony bassist. She loves that. She would love to do that, but uh, she hasn't played string instruments before, so that would be a whole new thing for her. Very cool. Uh, at this time, she is. She got a B plus last semester in biology, but right now it's looking like all A's. So yeah, she plays 10 more instruments than I can too. This this talent did not come from me. I would argue that voice is also an instrument and she's quite the singer. So anyway, she is a one woman orchestra. Enough of me bragging about my children. Um, but I'll keep you up to date on her, her travels in New York, because I think it's interesting that she's doing this. Uh, she is in the drum corps. And that's where she plays the marimba and the vibraphone, because apparently anything that you whack with a mallet or a stick qualifies as being in the um, the drum line. So that's why she plays those two. She just learned this year how to play them so she could participate in that. Yeah. Oh, very good. Love it. A lot of um, a lot of musicians in the crowd. So I'll see you tomorrow morning on the Nikki Maduro show. And then that's at 9am followed by the Mark Thompson show at 11. And then we'll do some more after partying live here uh, at the after party live. And of course, this show starts when the Mark Thompson show ends. And I'm banging on things. That's right. Vibraphone is awesome. Vibraphone is a little it's, it is awesome. It's a little weird sounding the way they play it. But yeah. Mm hmm. Thank you guys for spending your afternoon with me. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I will see you right back here tomorrow. But for now, bye-bye. The After Party Live would like to thank the following contributors and viewers like you.